Hello and welcome to the podcast. This is Ron's Amazing Stories, where we play tales to take you away from today. On the show this week, we have more stories. Now this is a surprise. Really? We have a tale about a sister who is followed by a ghost, a complete history of a haunted mansion, and Sylvia is back with another edition of Ghost Stories with Sylvia. That's amazing. Yeah, and it's a whole week earlier. So buckle up and get yourself ready for this five-minute mystery. Another five-minute mystery. This five-minute mystery is being brought to you by Ron's Amazing Stories. We play stories so you don't have to. Where stories are first and everything else is not. So remember, if you have a choice, choose the RAS. Inspector Howard, I asked to have you come up here today because I wanted to explain this case in person. Well, I'm anxious to hear about it, sir. On the 654 train from Chicago West today, there'll be a private car. In that car will be James Mayhew. He's carrying with him almost a million dollars in jewels, which he wishes to take to the West Coast. He trusts no one with them. Now, I want you to watch the entrance to that private car like a hawk. One of our trainmen, Mr. Barnes, will join you at the train. He'll have a letter from me. All right, sir. I'll do my best to prevent an accident. You know, I've been a railroad man all my life, Inspector. Used to be a conductor right on one of these trains. Yes, I know. You showed me that in the letter when you met me in Chicago. Uh, By the way, uh, you're sure Mayhew is alone in there? Yes, except for the steward. You know, though, I think I'll just step back there and see if everything's all right before it's time for him to go to bed. Okay, I'll wait here for you. Mr. Inspector, Mr. Inspector. Yeah, what's the matter? I, I'm the steward for Mr. Mayhew's car, sir. An awful thing has happened. Yeah, what is it? Well, they, they sent me to the galley for something. Well, sir, when I came back, Mr. Barnes was gone, and there was Mr. Mayhew shot, sir. Shot right through the head. Well, come on, let's get in there fast. Where is he? Right there, sir. Right there on the floor. Yeah. He's dead, all right. Uh, where's Barnes? I don't know, sir. I don't know. He he was gone when I came back. Yeah, what's that? Uh, I don't know, sir. Hey, quick. It's in that locker. Open it up. Uh, Barnes! What's happened? Here, wait. I'll have that gag off in a jiffy. Uh, uh, Boy, that steward. Hold him. Grab him quick before he gets away. No, no. He hit me over the head and then bound and gagged me. I came to when he put me in that locker there. Then I heard a shot. His, His Mayhew... Yes, he's dead, Barnes. Shot through the head. The, the jewels. I haven't had time to look. Search the steward. He has them. He'd planned to throw me off the train and make his getaway at the next stop. Uh, did you notice what time it was when you came to, Barnes? Yes, I did. I got my hands free and I could see through one of the air holes. It was nine minutes to eleven. I didn't do it, sir. I swear I didn't. I'm sure you didn't, steward. In fact, just to prove it, Barnes, I'm, I'm putting you under arrest. At least until we can reach Chicago by telephone. In just a moment, we'll see why the inspector arrested Barnes instead of the steward. But first... Okay, I think that our detective is throwing darts and seeing where they land. Because I think he has the wrong guy here. Think about it. This guy killed the other guy, then tied himself up, smacked himself in the head, and waited to be found? Sounds like a victim to me. Let's head back and see why the detective picked our guy. Oh, and this story is brought to you by Ron's Amazing Stories. Blah, 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 blah. And now, back to our five-minute mystery. Me? Under arrest? Yes, Barnes, you made one mistake. And I'm willing to take a chance that'll hang you. When I asked you what time it was, you said it was nine minutes to eleven. Any railroad man with the experience the real Barnes has had would naturally say 1051. You've been impersonating Barnes, went in and shot Mayhew, and locked yourself in the locker, gagged. And just to prove it... No, no. Yeah. Uh, the jewels are right here in your pocket. 
Yeah, nice work, Barnes, but not nice enough. Okay, now I'm outraged. His proof is the guy says five minutes to rather than 55 minutes after? Come on, man. That's crazy. Ron, he had the jewels on him. Oh, yeah. This five-minute mystery was brought to you by Ron's Amazing Stories. We play stories so you don't have to. Want to hear a story that you've never heard before? Unless, of course, you have. Then come to Ron's Amazing Stories. How did I miss that jewel thing? Because you're an idiot. I received this email from Peter Baldwin, who lives in Austin, Texas. A favorite city of mine, by the way. I just love the bats. Peter writes, Hello, Ron. Love the show and want to do my part to support you. I see that you now have Audible as a sponsor. Good on you. I would like to go sign up, except that I've been a member almost as long as you. What I can do is suggest one of my favorite books, Neverwhere by Neil Gaiman. He also narrated it. It is a science fiction fantasy tale that is listed as one of the top 100 stories ever. Keep up the great work and thank you for what you do, Peter. Well, Peter, thank you for your email and for listening to the show. I've not heard of the book before, but I've already added it to my audible queue. I do know that Neverwhere was a popular BBC miniseries that ran, I think, sometime in the 1990s. If I remember right, it had some pretty good critical success. Peter, I also want to say that this kind of support to the show is much appreciated, and it makes me happy that we can share our experiences together even the types of stories that we enjoy. I have some news for you guys. I'm in the process of updating the categories for the various shows. With the current format of the podcast, the categories on the main website simply just don't make any sense anymore. The shows are no longer genre-based and calling one science fiction when in fact it might have multiple topics just doesn't work anymore. However, going through 400 programs is very time-consuming, so don't look for this project to be completed anytime soon. This only affects the main website and has nothing to do with how you find the show. So, in my mind, it's a pretty minor project. The only reason I mention it is in case you use the category function to find podcasts that you want to hear. This may produce some unpredictable results right now. And now, this word from Audible. Today's podcast is being brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories. They have over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, computer, Kindle, whatever you have, you can listen to Audible on it. So, what am I listening to right now? One of my favorite authors ever is Sir Isaac Asimov. I think I may have read or at least reviewed every book that he has written. One of his best, and the one that many believe made him the superstar he was, was of course, I, Robot, read by Scott Brick. This audiobook contains 10 stories of robots gone mad, of mind-reading robots, robots with a sense of humor, and robots who secretly run the world all told with the dramatic blend of science fact and science fiction that became the Asimov trademark. Now, I do want to point out that this is not the movie that starred Will Smith. 
These stories inspired that movie along with other books he wrote about robots. Now, you can have this book today. Here's what Audible has set up for us. Audible is offering a free audiobook and 30 days to give you the opportunity to check out their service. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial/ronsamazingstories. Again, that's audibletrial.com/ronsamazingstories and you can get your free book today. Thank you Audible. And now it's time for your stories. These are your stories sent by you for you. story this time comes from Bridgewater, Iowa, population 150 souls. Not a big town, but that is where Mike Fenton writes this email from. Hello, Ron. Love the podcast, and I've been listening for about three months. My favorite part of the show is These Are Your Stories. I listen to a lot of podcasts, and you're the only one that reads them, and you read them so very well. Thank you. Here is my story, and I hope you like it. Mike. Well, thank you, Mike, for that comment. It really means a lot to me for you to say that. I have to say, I too enjoy this segment, and reading the stories, man, it is so much fun. Now, here is Mike's story that he has called The Following. My sister has ghosts that have followed her around for years. I've had the chance to live with her for about three months. I had just finished a tour in Afghanistan and was putting my life back together. During that time, so much weird stuff happened that all my sister could say was that her ghost didn't like me. Some of the things that happened to me were like going to bed with everything locked up and the lights switched off and then waking up in the morning with the back door open and all of the lights on. And a teapot kettle boiling. And no, my sister did none of it. You see, she works nights as a security guard and wasn't even home. One night, my sister and I were getting ready to go out, and I asked to borrow some shampoo. I used it and put it back. Ten minutes later, she was asking me for it, and it was nowhere to be seen. She accused me of taking it and even made me buy her a new one. About a year or so later, she was packing to move to a new house, and she found it in a shoebox with some old letters. The shoebox was zipped up inside a suitcase, and that was underneath the bed. Probably the most scared I ever felt was one afternoon when I was the only one in the house. I had arrived home from looking for work and headed straight to the bathroom. All the doors, windows, etc. were closed. I was standing in the bathroom washing my hands when a female voice behind me yells, Stop wasting water, you rat! Editorial note, Mike did not use the word rat. It was loud enough and sounded real enough at the time I thought it was my sister. So I laughed and told her to blank off and then asked what she was doing for dinner. No answer. I stuck my head out into the hallway. No one was there. I searched the house from top to bottom, and I was alone. I have been through three tours of duty in Iraq, Iran, and Afghanistan. I've sat guard duty with bullets flying over my head and lived to talk about it. However, that day, I went out on the front porch and waited outside until my sister got home. The last straw was when I was physically attacked while cleaning the bathroom. It felt like I was being bitten on the arm. I looked down and watched as teeth marks appeared on my forearm right next to my army tattoo. I moved to my parents' home the very next day. 
My sister has never had any luck with boyfriends. They keep getting spooked off. Also, she can never hold on to a roommate for any length of time. They literally leave the house screaming. She has tried to move, asked priests for help, and even had ghost hunters come and investigate. None of these people find anything wrong. My sister has never had any problems when she lives alone, and everything is peaceful and good. What is this entity following her? I surely don't know. Mike Fenton, Bridgewater, Iowa. Well, Mike, that doesn't make any sense at all, and I really feel for your sister. I do want to thank you for your service and all that you did for us. For your sister, the only thing that comes to mind is a poltergeist. Something that may help you out is to research just what that can mean and understanding the cause. I'm not an expert, but I have heard of such cases before. Thank you for your story, Mike. This next story comes from Gooseport, Louisiana. I just had to look this one up. Gooseport is located within the city of Lake Charles, and that, in turn, is located within the Calcasieu Parish. Keep in mind that Louisiana does not use counties. Miriam Webster sent this in, and she writes, My story begins with General David Bradford, a.k.a. Whiskey Dave, the leader of the Whiskey Rebellion who fled the 13 colonies to escape imprisonment. Bradford built Laurel Grove in 1796, moving his family along with him. Bradford sold the home to his daughter Sarah and her husband Clark Woodruff in 1820. In 1830, Sarah and two of her three children died unexpectedly. Some say that they died of yellow fever. Others believed that they were poisoned by the famous Chloe, a ghost who was reportedly once a slave owned by Clark and Sarah. In 1831, Clark sold the land. The new owners changed the name to the Myrtles Plantation, expanded the home, and filled it with furnishings from Europe. In the 1950s, the first ghost sighting was reported by then-owner Marjorie Munson, who reported seeing a ghost in a green turban. In the 1970s, the home began to operate as a bed and breakfast. In 1984, a journalist with Life magazine visited to write on the 222-year-old mansion. He got more than a story about beautiful architecture. The journalist reported having been in the presence of two children who would call him by name and then disappear. Frances Kierman confirmed the story in her 2005 novel, The Myrtles Plantation, The True Story of America's Most Haunted House. I am an Appaloosas native and currently own the Myrtles Plantation along with my husband John Moss. We knew going in that the place was haunted, though I truly believed it was just a marketing scheme. For the first seven years we lived on the top floor of the mansion while the bottom continued as a bed and breakfast for traveling guests. Our first encounter occurred less than two weeks after moving in when I heard a ghost call out my name in John's voice. Couldn't have been him, because he was on a business trip at the time. I called my friend and supernatural expert, Mary Jo McKay, who explained that the spirits were welcoming me using a voice that I was comfortable hearing. The next week, I heard the same thing again, but in a voice of a childhood friend. This was to be the first of many occurrences we encountered. My sons, Dawson and Morgan, often saw apparitions of children around the home. It was 1993, and my youngest son, Morgan, was ten and a half months old and was sleeping in an antique bed with iron railings. I was in my office typing the menu for the day for our restaurant. I heard a raspy voice say, Check your baby. I disregarded it, thinking that my mind was playing tricks on me, and I continued to type. Check your baby, the raspy voice said again. This time I knew I couldn't ignore it, so I went to Morgan's room, and sure enough, he wasn't there. 
I ran around the house, yelling his name, and finally heading out the front door onto the brick courtyard. There he was, toddling towards the edge of the pond. I screamed, Morgan, and I ran to him and scooped him up. As I held him, a warm blanket enveloped the two of us. It was so real that I could feel the fabric and the warmth. Then that same voice said to me, You need not worry. Your family will never be harmed here. That was a transformation for me. I truly believe the spirits here are angels set to protect us. We have left the house now and are retired. Morgan is 26 years old and he runs the place with his brother Dawson. They do a fine job. Miriam Webster, Gooseport, Louisiana. That is an excellent story, Miriam, and thank you for sharing it. In case you thought I missed it, did you know that in 1806, Webster published a compendious dictionary of the English language? The first truly American dictionary. <laughs> Also, I did a little research and came up with another tale about that famous plantation. Hester Eby, director of tourism for Myrtle's Plantation for more than 30 years, also believes that the ghosts are friendly. One of her most memorable moments was the first time she met a ghost child. I saw a little girl walking up the walkway with her mother and father. The man asked for two tickets. I asked, what about your daughter? He quickly changed his smile to a frown and let me know that they may never have children. But coming up the walkway behind them was this little girl. I was just going to tell the little girl just how pretty she was. She had long blonde hair and was dressed in an antique white dress, skipping along. I turned my attention back to the couple, and when I looked back, the child had disappeared. When they got into the house with their guide, I decided to look for the little girl. I found no sign of her. I walked back up to the porchway, and when I put my hands on the door to go in, I heard a giggle from the north end of the porch. I looked, and there she stood. I said, hello there. She smiled, and then disappeared again. So, Marin, you're not the only one that's had some positive experiences at the Myrtle Plantation. Thank you, Marion. Do you have a story that you want to tell on the show? If you do, we want to hear it. It can be about any subject and from any genre. It doesn't even have to be true. Original fiction stories or stories from the public domain are quite welcome. To submit them, head to ronsamazingstories.com and click on the story submission banner. Fill out that form and soon your story will be heard. Do you have a story and you don't want to write it? That's okay too. Just leave your contact information, a brief description of your story, and I'll get back to you. We can write it together. However, if you don't do it, your story remains just that your story. Why not make it our story and share it with the world? We all love a good story, but what we truly crave is a ghost story. It's time now for Ghost Stories with Sylvia. Sylvia Schultz is a librarian and author by day, but at night, she becomes a ghost hunter. Following a lifetime spent in the pursuit of the weird and the strange, her non-fiction works include Ghost of the Illinois River, Fractured Spirits, 44 Years in Darkness, Hunting Demons, and 
the spirits of Christmas. We now cross over the veil and join Sylvia as she tells us more tales from the unknown. Are you there, Sylvia? I'm here. Come on in, Ron. Sylvia! Hey! Is that a new ottoman? It most certainly is. Would you like to have a seat? It's very comfortable. I would. And do you have any more of that delicious lemonade? Of course. Here, let me pour you a glass. So, tell us about the book, Fractured Souls. What's going on? Well, I am very excited to say that it is out in ebook. And hopefully by the time this episode goes to air, the print book will be out as well. I'm very excited about that. In a nutshell, tell us about the book. What is this one about? We remembered Fractured Spirits was a collection of stories about the hospital itself. What is Fractured Souls? Fractured Souls is more of the same. People have continued to have experiences at the Peoria State Hospital, and historians have continued to learn more facts about the history of the place. So I've collected even more stories and even more facts and collected them into another book. Well, that sounds great. How many stories can we expect in this one? Oh, boy. <laughs> well, gosh, there are about uh, 15 or 20 chapters. They cover things like the, the old Bowen building. We have talked about Rhoda Derry some more, and I share some new stories about her. There's a new building, uh, well, <laughs> a new old building that I talk about. I didn't discuss the firehouse earlier, which is the oldest building on the hilltop. And you know how all good castles and theaters and college campuses have a lady in white or a lady in black or a lady in brown? Well, we have our own lady in white. Oh, wow. As a matter of fact, we have three of them. You know, I'm not surprised. I've, I've looked at <laughs> pictures of that place. It is a massive mm -hmm. area. Yeah. And the neat thing is that it's, it looks massive when you look at it in photographs, but it was, it was laid out to be able to be walked before the advent of, of the use of cars on a regular basis. In the very early days, people got around either with buggies or on foot. So it's a very easy place to walk. And that is part of the charm of Fractured Souls is that the last chapter is a walking tour where oh, wow. I take you on a tour of the hilltop. And that is also, you can find that on the Fractured Spirits fan page on Facebook. It's, there's an audio version of it too. So you'll have me walking right next to you and telling you all the sights. Oh, that sounds fantastic. Yeah. So it's available now on Amazon. Yes, the ebook is available right now. It's $4.99 right now. Four ninety nine. Yeah. Oh wow! So I'm going to encourage everybody go to Amazon right now. Just pause the tape. <laughs> go to Amazon, buy the book, and then come back. We'll wait. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sylvia. Now, the last time we talked, you said that you were going to read us something from the book. Are you going to follow through with that promise? Of course, I never make promises that I can't keep. So what are you going to read for us? How would you like to hear the very first words of the book? I could think of nothing better. Okay, sounds good. The Jehovah's Witness, who periodically stops by my house to see about the state of my soul, happened to come by when I was working on this book. He's always pleasant, always starts off his conversation by asking me how I'm doing. So I told him I was working on a second book about the Peoria State Hospital. His witnessing partner, an elegant platinum blonde in a stylish cardinal red wool coat, gave a shiver that had nothing to do with the 15 degree weather on the porch. <laughs> Partonville, she muttered. She flashed me a quick smile. When I was a kid, I thought the entire town was crazy, you know, because that's how everybody referred to the state hospital, Bartonville. The man nodded. My grandfather was in there. He had a nervous breakdown, and that's where they sent him. And my mother worked there. She was a clerk typist. I shook my head, grinning. I tell you what, you talk to just about anyone in this area, anyone who grew up here, and they're going to have a story about the state hospital. 
The lady in the red coat piped up brightly. My aunt ran off with one of the patients. <laughs> <laughs> I was aching to ask her to elaborate on that story. But the witnessing started, and it was still 15 degrees out, hardly the right weather to stand out on the porch and beg for stories, as fascinating as they promised to be. The doors of the Peoria State Hospital closed for the final time in 1973, but you'll be hard-pressed to find a more active place. Now, instead of the shuffle and conversation of patients and the voices of caregivers briskly giving orders, the hallways of the remaining asylum buildings are much more likely to echo with the noisy blurts of an SB7 spirit box, the beeping of a REM pod, or simply the quiet reverence of paranormal investigators sitting quietly in the dark, waiting to contact the dead. You see, the past isn't dead at the Peoria State Hospital, and the dead aren't gone. The abandoned asylum is now known across the country as a place where the past still lives, both in well-worn stories and in new experiences. And those experiences are overwhelmingly paranormal in nature. This book and its predecessor, Fractured Spirits, will challenge what you may have been told over the years about the Peoria State Hospital. You hear haunted mental asylum, and you assume you know the sordid story so common to other institutions that house the mentally ill. People who suffer from mental illness inhabit a very confusing and at times frightening world. But the Peoria State Hospital was a place of refuge for the suffering. With these stories, I intend to shine light on the shadows of mental illness as it was experienced in one of the most progressive institutions in the world. Can I clap? <laughs> of course. <laughs> that was fantastic, Sylvia. Thank you. That is some good writing. And believe me, I know good writing when I hear it. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I, can't read what, I can't wait to read the rest of the book. Thanks. As a matter of I'm fact, I'm so eager to share this with people. This is this is great stuff. Yeah. As a matter of fact, can we pause right here while I go buy it? <laughs> sure. Go ahead. Shoot. shoot. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm I'm excited about it, and I know that a lot of people out there, if you've read Fractured Spirits, it has that same feel already. I can tell, and hey. uh, I can tell already it's something I want to be part of. So, thank you for reading that, Sylvia. That's good stuff. Oh, it's my pleasure. We have here in Vancouver, we have Fort Vancouver, the famous place where the Hudson's Bay Company got their start. Ooh. And I'll tell you that everybody in this city has a story about that fort. Either they visited it as a kid or they go to it every weekend or, or they have some story about playing there or going to one of the reenactments that they do there. Everybody mm -hmm. in this city has some connection with Fort Vancouver. And mm -hmm. I'm telling you, it sounds like this hospital is that for you. Yes, that is the truth. That is a place that is very, very dear to my heart. Well, Sylvia, now also last time we talked about that we were going to get to our ex-murdering friend. And mm -hmm. are you ready to, to do that for us? Oh, of course. This is an amazing story. It was a really fabulous adventure to be able to go on. And um, yeah, if you go out and buy the 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 ebook e of Fractured Souls or the tree book of Fractured Souls, you'll be funding more visits to places like Villisca. <laughs> <laughs> so I do appreciate everybody who buys a book because that allows me to go out and have these adventures and tell you guys about them through Ghost Stories with Sylvia and through Ron's Amazing Stories and through Lights Out. So I'm very privileged to be able to share, share stories with you. Well, let's start with a history. Let Give us kind of a background of the Valenska House. Okay. So... On June 10th, 1912, the Moore family of Villisca, Iowa, had just gotten back to their house, a very tiny, quiet little house in the small town of Villisca, Iowa. They had been out at a church program. Josiah and Sarah Moore were the parents of the family, and they had four children, Herman, who was 11, Mary, who was 10, Arthur, who was seven, and Paul, who was five. So on Sunday evening, they went to a church program and saw a bunch of their friends. They're very active in the Presbyterian church. 
And they came home. There were two little neighbor girls, Ina and Lena Stillinger. And Mary Moore, being an only daughter, <laughs> she she thought she probably wanted some some little girl company. She invited the Stillinger girls to sleep over. And her parents said it was okay. And the Stillingers lived out in the country. So the Stillinger parents said, well, that's fine if the little girls stay over there. Um, Lena was 12 and Ina was eight. So they were good company for a 10-year-old Mary. So they came home from this church program and they all went to bed. And sometime in the very wee hours of Monday morning, June 11th, 1912, someone either broke into the house or crept out from a hiding place in the house and slaughtered everyone in the house with an ax. He started with the parents. He started with Josiah and Sarah. And these, everybody was brutally dispatched with ax blows to the faces. <sighs> he then moved to the children's bedroom. Herman, Mary, Arthur, Paul were all killed in their beds. Fortunately, none of them were awake for this. The murderer went downstairs to the kitchen, fixed himself something to eat, and then heard a noise from the guest bedroom off of the parlor where the Stillinger girls were asleep. And it is suspected that Lena, the older girl, woke up at that point because she is the only victim that had defensive wounds on her hands. Hmm. And when they found her, she was kind of leaning half off the bed like she was reaching for something. But the two little Stillinger girls were killed as well. So the next morning, Monday morning, dawned bright and clear. And uh, the neighbors realized that the moors were not out doing their morning chores. The cows hadn't been milked. The chickens hadn't been had their eggs gathered. And everything was very, 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 very quiet over at the moor house. So a neighbor decided to check on them and see what was going on. And he came in and found the entire family slaughtered. Hmm, that's terrible. Mm -hmm. And they never found out who did it. Yeah, you were saying that to me before. I find that hard to believe. They Just some passerby decided that this was going to be something he did, wanted to do, and they had no yeah. evidence to track him? <sighs> there are people much more knowledgeable about this case than I am. Troy Taylor wrote an entire book on the Velisca Axe murders, and he points out that it was possibly one of a series of axe murders that happened all across the Midwest mm. in 1912. And it may have been somebody who hopped the rails. I do not have those, the names of the suspects at my fingertips. But um, yeah, he does a very good job of outlining the case against several men who were suspected of this. And that Velisca is right on the railroad. And the Velisca house, the house in which this happened, is very close to the track. Hmm. So it was very easy for the murderer to just hop on a train and disappear. So how did the house end up being labeled as haunted? Well, um, somebody bought it. it. It was turned into a rental house for quite some time. It, it was 1912, so there's no indoor plumbing, no running water in the house, no, mm -hmm. no indoor, indoor bathroom in the house. When it was turned into a rental house, they put a bathroom in the pantry right off the kitchen, but now they have since torn it out. Maybe 50? 15, 20 years ago? I could be totally wrong on that. But they stopped it being a rental house. The owner stopped it being a rental house and opened it up for paranormal investigations because the people who lived in it when it was a rental house were interviewed on Ghost Adventures. Oh, yeah. And yeah, they told Zach Bagans that they never felt comfortable in the house. They were they, they just always had horrible feelings in the house. And with that psychic residue, of course, you're going to have that. Mm -hmm. But they, they told awful stories about, about their experiences. And, and they had to live there. I mean, I was there for one night. <laughs> they had to live there. So I'm sure their experience was far different than mine was. Then there was a, an investigator. Ooh, this was only a couple of years ago. But this misguided fellow set up camp. He rented the house for himself for the entire evening and set up camp, I believe in the parlor. And this is going to be gross, but it, he, he basically committed Harry Curie. He stabbed himself in the stomach. Oh, no. He survived. Oh. He survived, but he was trying to call up demonic energy 
in this house that saw so much tragedy and everyone in the paranormal community is like, what were you thinking? (laughs) So yeah, there's some very interesting energy there. So I guess that leads me to my next question. How did your visit go? Oh, Ron, I got to tell you, this was a really special experience for me. I like to call myself a paranormal investigator, but what I have discovered that I really am is more of a paranormal reporter. If I catch some evidence, that's great. But what I'm really going into these situations for is to have the experiences so that I can turn around and share them with you guys, with the people who listen to my stories. So keep that in mind as you listen to this. Okay. I got into the, went into the house. I was there with a group with uh, Troy Taylor's American Hauntings, a tour he was putting on. And I had the incredible privilege of being in the house by myself for about 45 minutes before everyone else got there. I don't consider this a privilege, Sylvia. (laughs) (laughs) It was really incredible. Um, Everyone else had gone to supper at a restaurant and Troy gave me the keys. We've been friends for years and he gave me the keys and said, have fun. We'll be back in a while. (laughs) So I went in there and I started a couple of recorders going and I walked through the house narrating as I went because I'm going to be doing a Lights Out episode on this, of course. Yes. And I've been ghost hunting for several years now. I'm still not to the point where I can sense individual spirits in a place. I'm working towards that. Someday it'll happen. I have faith. But I have gotten to the point, I think, where I can stand or sit quietly and feel the energy of a place. And the energy in the Velisca house was light, kind of expectant. I think the house knew that there were going to be visitors there. And I just got the sense that now, now keep in mind, it was still light. <laughs> it was yeah. still light out. It was, it was May at about uh, seven o'clock at night. So it was still kind of light out. So I just got the feeling that this was a house of love. There was a family that lived there. These people had four children. The kids had friends over to stay the night. Hmm. This was a place where happy memories were made. And then somebody came along and screwed it all up. Well, you know, when you were explaining that before, when you were talking about the murders, and none of that occurred to me that prior to this, this was a nice family. Yeah. They were just living, doing their normal thing. Just minding their own business. Well, that doesn't, yeah, What I guess what I'm having the revelation here is that they might not remember the negativity of everything. They might be there just experiencing their day-to-day lives that they did when they were happy. I really think so, because none of them, except for Lena, was conscious when they passed. They were just went to sleep and they never woke up. Hmm. That's very interesting. Yeah. I've never thought of it in that venue. You look at all the television shows that we have today, and they're all so wanting negative things to happen. Yeah, yeah, I don't get that. I don't see it. I don't see the this side. So I hate to interrupt, and I'm sorry for doing it, but I, oh, I wanted fine. to make that point. Yeah, yeah, that's that's the feeling I got from the energy of the house, was this is a place where happy lives were led. Is a place of children's laughter, of games, of reading around the, the light in the parlor after dark. This was a place of happiness. The kitchen was huge. And I could just imagine family meals taken there. I, I just, I wandered around the house soaking up these happy family memories, with one exception, which I'll tell you about. Okay. So I, I, I went upstairs, and the, the leading theory is that whoever it was came into the house before the Moors got back from their church thing and hid in the attic and crept out in the wee hours of the night from the attic, which is the at, door to the attic leads into the Moors' bedroom, the adults' bedroom. Hmm. So it's quite possible that he, he hung out in there. And going up those stairs, it's very narrow stairs. They creak like, whoa. I'm like, there is no way 
even if the people were asleep, that somebody could sneak up those stairs. He had to have been in the house. So I, I walked into the attic knowing this. And the attic is pretty bare. There are a couple of uh, children's toys up there for trigger objects and a couple of chairs up there. And I walked around and I'm looking at it. And I noticed that above me in the ceiling, the nails for the to tack the shingles onto the roof were sticking out. And it was just <laughs> this, this really treacherous looking cobweb of nails sticking out into the roof. And I said aloud for the, the recorder, and you'll, you'll hear this in lights out, I said, wow, if you were hiding up here, especially in the dark, you'd really have to watch your head, especially if you're a tall guy. I mean, you could really hurt yourself if you knocked your head against these nail points. Mm. And as soon as I said you could really hurt yourself, I got this feeling of I really shouldn't be in here anymore. And I noped it right out of there. <laughs> wow. And went back into the rest of the house and then I was fine. After that, the feeling went away and I was good. So everyone came back after I'd been in the house for about 45 minutes and we started the investigation. Uh, some people had recorders going, some people had dowsing rods, some people had K2 meters, and we got a lot of wonderful K2 meter activity that night. It was very exciting. So. At one point, uh, this is a very, very small house. I find it, it had to have been crammed to the rafters with four children and two adults living there. <laughs> so a very, very small house. And you can hear a lot. Sound really carries. <laughs> so I was upstairs in the children's room, and it wasn't quite dark yet. It was kind of getting on towards dusk. And I was sitting in the children's room upstairs by myself. And there were a couple other people sitting in the attic. And we were all very, very quiet. The people in the attic were recording. I was not. I was just kind of letting the energy kind of flow around me. And the closet door in the children's room tends to open and close on its own. So I was sitting there watching the closet door. There are three beds in the room. Two of them are perpendicular to the door. And another one is against the far wall parallel to the door. I was sitting on the far wall bed and there was... Uh, the end of the bed was close to me. So I was sitting there, just feeling the energy in the room and watching the closet door. And all of a sudden, from the end of the bed that was sitting next to me, I heard a snap. And it wasn't like a finger snap. It was like a branch breaking, this short, sharp sound. And I said, what the fudge was that? <laughs> <laughs> Only I did not say fudge. <laughs> Sylvia. <laughs> I, I sat there for a while and I'm like, I don't even know what that was. There was nothing there. I was alone in the room. So I, 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 I said, okay, I, I think I need to tell people about this. So I walked out of the room and I stuck my head into the attic and the people in the attic were looking at me going, what was that? I said, I have no idea. I was alone in the room when that sound happened. They're like, that's really weird. So I start down the stairs, and Troy Taylor's friend Lisa is at the bottom of the stairs looking up at me. I go, hey, Lisa, I just heard the strangest thing. And she goes, yeah, we know. <laughs> <laughs> because when it happened and you yelped, Troy looked at me and said, I've never heard Sylvia cuss like that before. <laughs> <laughs> okay. so it was a really interesting evening and i curled up after everyone was done i curled up on the floor of the parlor and slept for several hours and nothing interesting happened i didn't get you know the covers pulled off me in the middle of the night or anything it was just a very relaxing night hmm. that is an incredible story I did sleep with that black chunk of black tourmaline clutched in my hand. And <laughs> that we talked about case. last month. Last time. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's incredible stuff, Sylvia. And I, first off, let me thank you for sharing that with us. That was a treat. Well, thanks. I, and I'm sure you're going to have more adventures to tell us in future uh, episodes of Ghost Stories with Sylvia. Oh, yeah. I am actually headed off to, to Gettysburg in a few weeks. Oh, I'd love to go with you. That's on my bucket list. I've heard so many ghost stories from that place. And I've never, it's oh, just, yeah. I don't, I'm not, wouldn't even necessarily want to go for the ghost stories. I just would love to see 
feel it because I guess from what I've been told, and I've been told this by several people, when you walk out into the the field, you feel everything. You don't even have to be psychic. You just all of a sudden start to feel different. And everybody that I've ever had on the show, anybody that has told a story about Gettysburg and every show that I've ever seen that's been on paranormal in relation to Gettysburg has said the same thing. So mm. you, I am now. Well, it, very will be, <laughs> it will be my first time ever going there. So I'm really looking forward to it. We've got an investigation planned of a battlefield near there where a lot of Confederate soldiers died. Hmm. So what do we got going on Lights Out coming up this next, I guess, next week? <laughs> the next episode of Lights Out is going to focus on a church called the Church of the Holy Family in Antioch, Illinois. I was privileged to do an investigation with shadow hunters, and we had some very, very interesting results. And I'll tell you all about it in Lights Out. All righty. Just so we complete the circle, how do we find your blog and how do we find fractured soul well my blog is at sylvia schultz.wordpress.com and that also has a lights out page that will take you to any link you possibly would like like to find that also has a links page fractured souls is set up just like fractured spirits in that when you see a little ghosty in the margin that will lead you to a computer link where you can if if i mention a video that someone captured or a sound recording you can actually go and listen to that sound recording or watch that video while you're reading the book that sounds so that links page is going to go up there too and fractured souls is on amazon well sylvia we have again believe it or not run out of time Okay, okay. So, Sylvia, again, I thank you for coming on the show, giving us some chills, giving us some thrills, and I can't wait till next time to hear what you got for us. Oh, it'll be another adventure, Ron. Thank you, Sylvia. Absolutely. Take care. I always have a great time talking with Sylvia, and I learn all kinds of new stuff. If you want to visit her on her own turf, head to sylviaschultz.wordpress.com. There you'll find her blog and access to her podcast, Lights Out. Also, Sylvia's book, 44 Years in Darkness, A True Story of Madness, Tragedy, and Shattered Love, is available as an audiobook on audible.com. I'll have all of the links available in the show notes. Ghost Stories with Sylvia was brought to you by Gladys Goodies. Good treats for your dog to eat. Go to gladysgoodies.com today and make your dog's tail wag. Also, don't forget to use our very own promo code RONS to get a 20% discount on all of your purchases. That is R O N S. So head to gladysgoodies.com and thank you, Gladdy. And thank you, Sylvia. A tip like this is worth a lot when you're shopping these days. It's something to remember. If mealtime is often spoiled in your home because it's such an effort to coax your children to eat their vegetables, listen carefully. You can now give your children the goodness of eight different vegetables in a delicious drink they'll love. Just give them V8 vegetable juices. V8 is one of the most enticing drinks that's ever been concocted. And here's the important thing. Every tempting sip of V8 contains the goodness from eight different vegetables. Tomatoes and beets of the red variety, lettuce, spinach, watercress, parsley, and celery of the leafy green variety, carrots of the yellow variety. Thus, when you serve V8, your children get both the goodness and variety of eight different vegetables. Get V8 vegetable juices tomorrow. Give it to your children for lunch, dinner, or between meals. They'll love V8, and it's really good for them. So ends the show. I want to thank this time Peter Baldwin, Mike Fenton, Miriam Webster, and Sylvia Schultz. If not for you guys, this podcast would not have been. 
If you want to follow the podcast or the blog, just head to ronsamazingstories.com. There you will find an amazing number of links that should fit every need. Do you want to help with the show? The best thing you can do is to tell your friends about it. And please leave reviews or feedback wherever you listen. This helps us to grow. Thank you for listening, and I hope you come again to find out what are Ron's Amazing Stories. All of the vintage audio used in the podcast is believed to be in the public domain. Ron's Amazing Stories does not own the rights to any of the old-time radio used here. If you hold the rights to any of the shows played, please contact us immediately at ronsamazingstories.com.